As of 2021, there are 31.7 million business owners in the United States. Many business owners are setting up LLCs. One out of every six taxpayers that comes to my office owns an LLC. I own six LLCs and I've set up over 5,000 LLCs for my clients. L to the L to the C. I love saying LLC because it reminds me of LL Cool J. LLCs are the most popular business vehicles that business owners set up. Why is it that most business owners who have LLCs aren't sure if they should be in LLCs? My name is Carlton Dennis, and in today's video, we are gonna go over what you need to consider before setting up an LLC. LLC owners make a lot of mistakes, I'm sorry. And in today's video, I need to point out some of the mistakes that you need to be conscientious of before establishing your LLC. Let's dive in. Mistake number one is not knowing the type of income you're receiving prior to setting up your LLC. This is really important and reason why is because there are three different income types you could be receiving and it could determine whether or not you need an LLC versus an S Corp or a C Corporation. The three different income types that you need to be familiar with are number one, ordinary income. Ordinary income is everyday income that you work for and is typically in the form of W-2 wages or 1099 compensation. The next form of income is passive income. Passive income is income you technically do not have to work for. Typically, you're familiar with passive income from investment properties or interest that you earn off of the money that you have in your bank account. The third type of income is portfolio income. Portfolio income is typically income that you receive when you decide to sell capital assets or if you have capital gains tax from the sale of a rental property. These three types of income are important for us to know because it can help us decide whether or not it makes sense for us to have an LLC. So let's talk about it. Number one, passive income. If we have passive income, what we have to understand is that passive income is not subject to social security tax or Medicare tax that ordinary income is subject to. So when you think about it, it may not make sense for you to worry about whether or not you have to eventually transition your LLC to an S corporation if you have rental real estate. If your income is passive, you don't have to worry about self-employment tax. So typically a lot of real estate investors will establish LLCs for their real estate holdings. So if you ever had the question in your head, why do people set up LLCs as opposed to C Corps or S corporations for their real estate? A big deciding factor around this is because real estate investors are not subject to the social security and Medicare tax that ordinary income earners are subject to. This leads me to ordinary income. Ordinary income is the income you're familiar with when you're working a job where you are putting in labor. Anytime you're putting in labor, you're gonna have to pay into Social Security and you're gonna have to pay into Medicare taxes. And if you decided to become a business owner, that means you pay into self-employment tax. It's been talked about in all of my YouTube videos if you've seen them. Now, one thing that you have to understand about ordinary income is that ordinary income, you will pay 15.3% self-employment tax, which is your social security and Medicare, but then you will also pay your federal taxes and your state taxes. So knowing that ordinary income is subject to self-employment tax, federal tax, and state tax, we have to define what type of business owners need to know that their business is actually ordinary income instead of passive business. Let's talk about that. I have clients all the time that'll get on the phone with me and tell me, Carlton, I have a passive business. I started Amazon Automation. I'm doing Amazon FBA. I'm selling products on Etsy. I have my online shop. Any of these clients that I talk to that have these businesses that are very automated had to work to get to a place where their businesses are automated. They sat on the computer, they figured out how to put up ads, build their website, hire the contractors, and someone else is doing the fulfillment and dropping off the orders to the house. That is a business that requires work. And if labor is involved, we are subject to social security and Medicare taxes, federal and state taxes. So I just wanted to make sure that when we go into setting up a LLC, that we also understand which type of businesses are ordinary income businesses and truly understanding what would be considered a passive business. 
Last but not least is portfolio income. I don't really get too much into the portfolio income unless I'm dealing with my real estate investors, which I primarily focus on. If you happen to have real estate income and you decide to sell an investment property, you're dealing with capital gains. It could be short or long-term capital gains, depending on how long you held onto that asset. But if you're aware of capital gain income, you might realize that this is actually categorized as portfolio income to your tax accountant. So understanding these three types of income can let us know whether or not you should have an LLC that's gonna remain as an LLC, or if you have an LLC that'll eventually be switched to an S corporation or another desired entity structure. Mistake number two with LLCs is not establishing your LLC prior to knowing that you wish to have a real estate acquisition. It comes up pretty often that I get on the phone with a client that told me that they just bought an investment property and now they're trying to decide whether or not it makes sense for them to have an LLC. And I sometimes wish that they would just have a conversation with me prior to them buying the rental property because then I might have advised them to establish the LLC prior to buying the rental property so that they can buy the property in the name of the LLC that they established for themselves. This is a way that we can completely avoid having your name ever online at the accounting assessor's office saying that you're on title for owning the property. But then we get to a place where you wanna have that asset protection because you find out that someone could slip and fall and hurt themselves inside of your property. So you eventually wanna have an LLC for liability protection, but the property is already in your name. So now we have to decide, does it make sense to set up an LLC and do a quick claim deed and retitle your property in the name of the LLC? Well, this is where we can run into some issues. At least I've had clients run into issues. One of the issues that they run into is this whole due on sale clause, where now there's a stipulation in their mortgage agreement that says that anytime a property is being transferred or sold, that the mortgage is now due. So this is where we have to be extremely careful and mindful prior to establishing LLCs and to investing in real estate. We have to speak with the tax pro. We have to speak with our mortgage company. We have to determine if we can purchase a rental property in the name of an LLC. And if you're setting up a brand new LLC months before you're trying to buy that investment property, we need to figure out what we need to do to make sure that that LLC will be ready to have credit in an income history report to qualify for the down payment that you wish to make through the LLC. So these are some things that you need to be mindful of prior to establishing your LLC and prior to getting into a real estate acquisition. Mistake number three with LLCs is not using your EIN number for your income and expenses. Taxpayer, I'm talking to you. You talking to me? Because if you're watching this right now, you're sitting back like, oh, that one's me. Why did you set up the LLC, but then not use the EIN number? This is the one thing that hurts you as a business owner. If you do not take it upon yourself to use that nine digit number, I believe it's nine digits, and take it to your bank and open up your business bank account, then you're not doing yourself a justice. You see, when you become a business owner, you can now deviate from using your personal credit to qualify for things. You can now establish a business credit card and start purchasing items underneath your business account. But getting to a place where someone wants to give you a business credit card is another situation. How do we get to a place where someone wants to give you a loan or give you credit? Well, I want to see an income history report if I'm a lender. If I'm a bank and I can see reports showing me income coming into your bank, for your business and expenses coming out of that same account, then it's easier for me to justify giving you a line of credit or giving you a loan. In the year of 2020, I had clients and taxpayers come to me saying, Carlton, why can I qualify for the PPP? Carlton, why can't I qualify for the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan? Many of my taxpayers couldn't qualify because they weren't running their income and expenses through their EIN number because they set up LLCs and never used them. This sucks because now you're in a position where you really needed that money, but from a business perspective, you didn't do all the steps that you needed to do to put yourself in the best possible position. So what we do is we turn to information. As a part of watching this video and a part of being on my channel, we want to adopt information so we can become savvier taxpayers. And that's the goal of this entire channel, is just to make you that much closer to becoming financially free. So one of the things that you need to make sure that you're doing is if you have a business with an EIN number, go to a bank that you feel comfortable with, set up your business bank account associated with that EIN number, and start allocating the income that you have and the expenses that you have going back to January into that LLC. So that way you can account for those income and expenses according to your business. All right, you guys are enjoying this? Let's keep going. Mistake number four with LLCs, not knowing what type of forms that you're supposed to use now that you're a business owner. This one is uh, one that I can't really blame you for because 
No one's teaching you what type of forms you're supposed to use. Most CPAs aren't doing tax planning, which means they aren't sitting down educating taxpayers on, hey, this is this form, hey, this is that form. Most of them don't provide those types of services yet, but they will. What I will say is if you're in that position where you're not getting that level of coaching from your CPA, he's truly just filing your tax returns, then you may not know what type of forms that you're gonna be filing inside of your tax returns in your first year of business. You have to find out the hard way after you've already paid some taxes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over some of the forms that you need to be mindful of being self-employed. Let's talk about it. Form number one, the Schedule C. Schedule C is only present if you are a sole proprietor business or you are a single member LLC. Well, the reason why the Schedule C is utilized is because the Schedule C is one of the easiest forms that a taxpayer can fill out to report their income and expenses. A Schedule C is just one page. It's a federal return, which means it goes inside of your 1040 tax returns and it shows the government all income items and all expense items and what you profited, which means after all expenses, what you profited at the end of the year. So the Schedule C form is just important for you to remember, but I, what I want you to remember is that is a letter. There are tons of different letters that you could have inside of your tax return. Schedule C is for 1099 income that you earn in excess of $400. The next form that you need to understand is going to be the 1065 form. If you decide to set up a partnership, which means that you have a multi-member LLC, whether it's you and a spouse, you and a relative, you and a business partner, you no longer file a 1040 with a Schedule C, you file a 1065 and you'll have a K-1 form that gets filed in your 1040. Before we go over the K-1 form, which I'll discuss with you next, let's discuss the 1065. The 1065 stands for United States Partnership Return. This means that you're in partnership with someone other than yourself. And anytime you're in partnership, you file a separate tax return outside of your personal tax return. So there are two returns as opposed to one tax return that a single member LLC would have. If you're a single member LLC, you just file your single member tax returns on a Schedule C all inside of your personal returns. If you decide to become a partnership, you have a 1065 over here and your individual personal returns are over here. This company will eventually file its returns and report income and expenses to you inside of your personal return. So that's what the purpose of a 1065 form is. Now, let's go over the K-1 form. We talked about how the 1065 receives income when you have a partnership and it pays you personally. But how does that transaction happen? Well, when the 1065 files its tax returns, it submits what's called a K-1 form. This K-1 form goes to any partner of the business. If you're the owner of the business and you have someone else in the business, you have a partnership, both partners will receive a K-1 form that gets submitted inside of the individual tax returns. And this is where you pay taxes one time. The 1065 partnership business does not pay taxes. The shareholders who receive their K-1s individually will pay taxes at their individual rate inside of their personal tax returns. I hope that made sense. So we've gone over the Schedule C, the 1065, and the K-1 form. The next form that I just wanna make sure you understand is the SS-4 form. When you go through setting up your first LLC, there will be some steps that you need to complete in order to make sure your LLC is set up correctly. One of those forms that you'll receive is called an SS-4 form. The SS-4 form is a form that allows for you to apply for your EIN number. I have mentioned in other videos that I view an EIN number almost like a social security number for your business because it's how your business is identified, it's how you go open up your bank account for your business, it's how you build business credit with your business. The EIN number is important for you. One thing that I've seen certain business owners do is they'll set up their LLC half or partial way and they won't go all the full extent to submit the SS4 form to the Secretary of State. Please do so, obtain your EIN number and now know what this form is. Anytime that you're establishing a new LLC, whether it's for a new investment property that you're thinking about starting or this new Amazon wholesaling business, whatever it is, an SS4 form has to be completed in order for you to obtain your EIN number. Last but not least is the W-9 form. The W-9 form is for 1099 contractors. Anytime you wish to hire someone and you're gonna pay them in excess of over $600, you need to have them complete a W-9 form so that way you can issue them a 1099 at the end of the year. The W-9 form is how you document who is actually being a contractor inside of your business to the government so you have physical proof that you've taken the correct steps when you issue them a 1099 at the end of the year. 
Most business owners will glaze over this step because sometimes getting into business can be confusing on how you're supposed to pay out people so you'll just end up transferring money or writing them a check. But you need to be mindful when you're hiring contractors that when you pay them over a certain amount that they need to be 1099. Just like you're a 1099 contractor when you decide to become a business owner, you also need to know when it makes sense to 1099 someone else for services that you're hiring them for within your organization. Number five, knowing how to reimburse yourself as an LLC. Many business owners get into a mistake of not knowing how to properly reimburse themselves when they are paying for business expenses that sometimes end up on the personal bank account. Let's just say you went into Staples and you forgot your business credit card at home and you're buying Staples and you're buying a printer and you decide to pay for that on your personal credit card. Well, how are you supposed to reimburse yourself? How are you supposed to allocate that over to your business? This is where having an accountable plan becomes so important. An accountable plan is how you reimburse yourself for having expenses that were personal that should have been allocated over to your business. There are special rules that you need to follow in order to make sure that your documentation is done correctly so that these expenses get allocated over to your profit and loss statement accordingly. If we do this correctly, we can take the business deductions and you can be reimbursed for the money that you spent personally for the business expenses that you incurred. This is extremely important that we focus on understanding what an accountable plan is early on as business owners because we could be in a place where we're paying for a lot of items personally that really are business items, but we may not have set up our business yet or don't have our business card established. So now we can be in a place where we can allocate those expenses over to business and be reimbursed for it. My name is Carlton Dennis. If you guys enjoyed this video today, I'd love for you to do something for me. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe so I can continue to make more videos like this for you. I'll see you on the next one.